And um, I just have a bunch of scriptures I want to go over today, so I'm going to jump right in. If you saw uh, the cover on our Facebook page, you saw the title today is called Choose Your Crown, and it's based on Philippians uh, chapter 2, verses really 9, 10, and 11 all together, but the part I put on the cover is Every Knee Will Bow. When I first became a Christian, the most popular song they were singing in the church that I attended was He is Lord. And that was the, the line was from this verse, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That never gets old, right? So I'll read that from Philippians chapter 2. Lord, as we open up your word, we thank you that you breathe life into your word. It's alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. We confess over our hearts that our hearts are good ground to receive the word of God that you want to implant in us. You don't want us to just learn in our brain, but you want us to incorporate this. You want the word to be metabolized right in our system, that we will eat your word like good food this morning, and it's going to nourish us better than any vitamins that we could ever take. This is the real vitamin B for your Bible, and, and Lord, we're just grateful for the truth of your word and how it strengthens us. No matter how confusing the world might be, you are the compass. You're, you're the true north compass that we look to. This is from the uh, New American Standard, Philippians 2.9. God highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. That includes coronavirus. That includes cancer. That includes any other name you want to say. It says every other name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Then verse 11 says, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That would be a good thing for us to do right now. Just say, Jesus Christ is Lord over my life. Every knee bows, my knee bows, and my tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, not everyone realizes that Paul was quoting an Old Testament scripture there from Isaiah. And I gave it to you here. It's Isaiah 45, 23, where God was saying through the prophet Isaiah, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back. That to me, every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. All right. So you can read it in the New Testament and not realize if you don't have a study Bible, it might not be footnoted. But Paul is saying, Jesus is saying the same words that God was saying through the prophet Isaiah, that to me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. But Paul was equating Jesus with God. There's many parallels of that in the word. You can rely on Jesus. He is the flesh of what God wants to represent. He came, he dwelt among us. He dwelt in the flesh among us. And we behold his glory. The image of the invisible God is shown to us in Jesus. Now, um, at this, if you have the other handout that I gave you, which says choose your crown at the top, um, I'm not going to get through all of this today, but it's, it's a really good little study guide if you want to know what we're focusing on and what we hear the Lord saying to us, okay? Because I don't think it's any coincidence that they called it coronavirus, and, and there's pictures of crowns, because that's what the devil has always tried to do. He's tried to counterfeit the truth of God, and if he can find vulnerable people who don't have enough truth in them, then the lie will stick. And now all of a sudden, we're bowing down to the knee of fear, and we have to stand our ground. It's a moment of truth right now, a big-time moment of truth, and say we are not going to be tormented by the fear of death, because we know who we serve. And you could come back and argue about, well, how come not everybody that you pray for is healed? You can't think that way, okay? You have to depend on the truth of the word and recognize that many people are blaming God for things that the devil is doing. And you could say, well, why did God allow that to happen? Because he gave us free choice in the garden. Adam and Eve had a choice to live in perfect communion with God, and they got tricked by a lie. And when that happened, it started a war. So yes, bad things happen to good people, and we don't always know why. But there's also stories of many people getting healed. We got one this week. I won't give it to you because I can't do as good of a job as the person who got healed from coronavirus. He got tested. He was positive for it. For a week, he was showing really severe symptoms. And then all of a sudden, God miraculously healed him. And he barely could even tell me the story. He was weeping out of so much gratitude. So that's what you need to focus on. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. 
Paul understood it. We're in the time of Passover, right? So next week is the uh, traditional Palm Sunday, and then the following week after that is Passover, really. Uh, we call it Easter, but it's really Passover. It's the Passover celebration. And that's part of what I want to tie in together for you today is that Passover is a change in government. Right, they were the Israelites were under the dominion of Pharaoh in Egypt, and they were slaves. Right, and when we were, when we weren't saved, but we didn't know the Lord before we had accepted Him as our Lord and Savior, we were under similar slavery to sin. But in the New Testament, we find out in John it says, "Who the Son sets free is free indeed." Okay, so we can come through the Red Sea in a different way through the blood of Jesus from that cross that's behind me. It's through his flesh being torn open and his blood that saved me. Just like the Red Sea in the Old Testament, we have the Red Sea of the blood of Jesus that we come through. And this is a great time of year to go back into the Old Testament in the book of Exodus and read about the Passover and the promises of God and how they had to have the blood on the doorposts of their house in order for the death angel to pass over. And that's his blood covering over us today. So that's going to be part of our connection today. Change in government. That's one of the, I'd say it's probably a misunderstood principle in the Bible, is government is not just about politics. Government is about authority. And who has the authority over your life? And you just say by faith, I submit to the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I submit to the authority of the best-selling book of all time. <laughs> The Word of God has authority in my life over what my culture tries to tell me. No, no comparison to what the culture is telling us compared to the eternal truth of the Word of God. It's alive and it's powerful, sharper than the authority of the government because when Paul, uh, in, in Paul's day, when the New Testament was written, that's from Hebrews that we just read. I believe Paul is definitely a possible author of that book. When he said it's alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, he, I think it was literal that he was talking about the Roman Empire that would come in with the sword and the violence. This is more powerful than the, the dictates of unbelievers. Our government is in God. And you probably all know this one from uh, uh, well, one that I'm going to get to in a minute. Let me start with, with Psalm 2 because here's this... If we look at our lives like a timeline, and you see on my handout that I gave you, it's contending for the authority, government over our lives, a new exodus, a new Passover, and then I have movement, right? Because that's the balancing act that we're trying to do. I'm moving between what I hear on the news that's trying to frighten me, and then what the Word of God says. And there's this movement back and forth. But if I look at this as the worldly way of thinking, and this as... God's way of thinking, there's a tug of war trying to pull me into the world, and then the Spirit of God is saying, no, don't go in that direction. Trust in me and believe in me. So I wanted to give you two parts of Scripture that tie together and that bring this out. You could almost think of this as a manual of rules of engagement of the warfare that we're in. Because if you didn't believe in spiritual warfare before, I sure hope you believe it now. Because we are in the midst of it, major big time. So, excuse me, the enemy is an orphan. He was kicked out of heaven for rebellion against God. And he's the prince, the ruler of this planet over this air, but he has no authority. The only weapons he can throw against us, there's, there's power in lies, but countered by the power of the truth of the word of God. Satan has no authority in your life. He just wants to trick you into thinking that he does. He does not. And the wording in Psalm 2 really spells this out. It's from David, and it's a song, right? Because all the Psalms, these are lyrics to songs. But when we read it, it says, Why do the nations, another uh, translation says, Why do the heathen rage, the unbelievers, the people who are far from God, why do they rage and plot a vain thing? The vain thing is similar to what God said. Only a fool would say in his heart that there is no God. And the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. But this is that same satanic, rebellious attitude that says, I will not submit to God. I refuse. Just like Satan said, I want to be God. I'm going to put myself in that throne. No, you're not, Satan. No, you're not. I bow my knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the word of God that I've been given in a country that was founded on the ability to have this freedom. 
Boy, how much do we appreciate our freedom now after we've been denied some of it, just some little bit of it. But imagine people in other countries who don't have what we have. Makes you appreciate it even more. So this is a question. Why do the nations rage? And why do the people plot a vain thing like I can live my life without God? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords from us. And then right under that, I have Acts chapter 4. So David just throws out this question, why are they raging against God? And why are they saying, get your hands off me, God. Stop trying to corral me into your disciplined lifestyle. I want to be able to do what I want, when I want. It's my body, and I can do whatever I want. If we want to just think about the sexual sin in, in the world. God says, you can do whatever you want, but I'm telling you, that's not the way to go to prosper. The way to go to prosper is to fall in love with somebody and commit your life to them, a man and a woman, and be married together. And then that act of intimacy that produces life is going to be blessed. Everything outside of that, he can't bless. And he says in Acts 4, this is Peter speaking a prayer out loud. They had just been released from being persecuted for talking about Jesus after they had been told not to. And here's the connection between the old coming through the Red Sea Passover and the new in the New Testament where Peter's talking in Acts chapter 4. He references Psalm 2. He says, for truly against your holy servant Jesus, who you anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, Gentiles, and even the people of Israel, all right? They all should have known better, especially the ones for the people of Israel. They were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined beforehand to be. So they are representing the heathen. They are representing the nations that are raging against God. And Peter has enough insight now through this after the second chapter of Acts, after the infilling of the Holy Spirit, he's gone from being somebody who denied the Lord to now one of the leaders in the church. What an amazing transition. Pretty obvious that there's a war going on. I can get pulled back into the world, or I can keep progressing. I can keep pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling that I have in Christ. We read it uh, here a little earlier. Though I walk in the flesh, this is 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but though I walk in the flesh, the weapons of my warfare are not carnal. They're not in the natural realm. They are mighty through God to the demolishing of strongholds. There's a stronghold of fear that's trying to grip the whole earth right now. And we say, no, greater is he in me than the one that's in this world. Or I'm going to keep going. The rest of Acts 4, 29 and 30, now, Lord, this is Peter praying. He says, now, Lord, look on these threats and grant to your servants that they won't kill us. No, it's not what he said. He's asking for boldness. That's what we should be doing right now, too. Lord, give me boldness. I'm still connecting with unsafe people. I know people that don't believe in you yet. This could be the exact time that they're crying out to God because they recognize they've built their house on sand not on the solid rock of Christ. Here's what he says. Lord, look on their threats and grant to us, your servants, that with all boldness we may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. So when we pray, this is the scriptural backing of saying, I pray in the name of Jesus. It's right here in Acts chapter 4. Ha! And after they had prayed this as a group in Acts 4.31, it says, And when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So just look at it the way I said. They could have gone, gotten pulled into the world this way. They chose to face God here and say, I'm going with you. I'm pressing forward into what you have for me, and I want boldness to do that so that I can turn back to the world with your weapons in me to help bring them out of that darkness and bring them into your light. Isaiah 9, this is the one I was thinking of before about government and how important authority is in your life because really, let's just be really honest, when we become Christians, we don't automatically lose all the thinking that we had over on this side, right? Right? We get saved, and if we die, we're going to heaven. But there's a process that happens 
called sanctification, where we renew our minds, right? Christians need to renew their minds with the Word of God. So if there's still parts that are dipping into the darkness because we haven't been fully renewed, there's always something God could show us. If I say this is the authority over my life, then I really have to study it and I have to know it. You know, there's another verse that says, even though you haven't seen him, you believe him. Blessed are those, even though you haven't seen him, you believe him. So if I really believe this is a love letter from my Abba Father to me about how I should live my life, then I want to be voracious in the way I study this word and renew my mind. And every day he could show me something new because it's alive. After you've read it a year ago, you're a different person when you read it today, and you'll get new insight. And Isaiah 9 is not just for Christmas, okay? It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, all right? That's the government. That's the, the, the fight over the authority, and who's going to have the authority in your life? Which crown are you choosing? I'm choosing the crown of thorns. I'm going with Jesus. He's going to renew my mind. His blood, he, he hung on that cross, and that blood was shed that I would now have a new and living way to the throne room of God, and I can come boldly into the throne room of grace. In my time of need, I'm allowed to access that power through the blood. So the government will be on his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then I love verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. All right, you got it? The government will be on his shoulder. And of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Government and peace. Claim that for yourself right now. Yes, Lord, whatever areas I have not submitted, wherever I'm not lining up with what you told me to do in the word of God, if I'm not connected to other believers that can strengthen me, that was one of those declarations that we made. I know my place. I'm connected with my tribe in the body of Christ so that I'm not trying to do this on my own. We have to learn how to trust. We can't do it alone. We need each other. Don't forsake assembling together with other believers. All right, and then in Mark 1.14, it says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So here's an assignment I'll give you during the week. Look up every time that phrase, kingdom of God, appears in the New Testament. It might surprise you. It's a favor that I'll ask you is when you look at Matthew and it says kingdom of heaven, those are equal. Those are the same thing. That's what we believe Kingdom of heaven in Matthew and kingdom of God in uh, other gospels is, is the same, has the same meaning. But this says that he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. All right? So in my analogy, there's two kingdoms, right? The kingdom of this world, and then there's the kingdom of God now, here, available to us now. Not when we die and go to heaven only, but now it's available to us. So we're standing in the middle of this tug of war, getting pulled back into the world. But no, I know that I have to press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling that he has for me. So this is right in Mark chapter 1. It's right at the beginning of the gospel. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He wasn't saying the world is coming to an end. And the kingdom of God is going to pull everybody away and go to heaven. It's not what it says in Revelation. It says he's coming back here with a new Jerusalem for the final rule and reign. And just what Adam and Eve had in the garden, we will have for eternity. I'm going to go to the next one. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. So when we come underneath his covering, the authority that he has, we'll see in a couple more scriptures, that he released that authority to us. Now, Satan's a liar, and he tried to convince Jesus that Satan had all the authority. He has none, but he's not going to stop trying to lie to you and says that he has authority. Don't believe the lies of Satan about who you are. Don't say to yourself, well, I've been a loser. I've made so many mistakes. God could never forgive me. That's another lie. Nobody is too far away from God. No matter what sin you've committed, he can still pull you into his kingdom. If you were the only person who ever lived, he still would have come and died for you. 
Hard to believe. I know it's too big to get our arms around how anybody could love us that much when we don't deserve it. But that's the worldly way of loving. The world makes you prove it over and over. That's called conditional love. God says, no, I love you unconditionally. You're made in my image. You're not walking in the fullness of who I want you to be. Come to me and let me show you how to live a full, vibrant, pr productive, very meaningful life that I always had designed for you. Don't follow the counterfeit plan of Satan. Luke chapter 4, verse 6 is when Jesus is being tempted by the devil in the desert. And the devil said to Jesus, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Talk about one of the most blatant lies of all time, okay? But that doesn't mean he's not going to keep trying to lie to you. Uh -uh. Jesus knew who he was, and he knew this was a lie. But that's the contending. Whose authority will you fall under? Which crown are you going to pick? And I picked the crown of Jesus. Luke 9.1. Then he called his disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure all diseases. Wow. How do you get around that verse in Luke 9.1? He gave the disciples power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. So Matthew 28, he says, all authority has been given to me. And then Luke 9, 1 says, he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority to cure diseases. And then again in Luke 10, behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. We have that authority. That's the authority of the believer. You need to walk in it. You need to know the truth of the word. So every time a lie comes your way, you have discernment. And you know because Holy Spirit prompts you. And you've learned to recognize his voice. And you know how to separate the voice of the shepherd from the thief that wants to come and steal and kill and destroy. John 16, 13 says, When he, the spirit of truth, has come... That's what you get when you say yes to the Lord Jesus. He fills you with his spirit as another form of power in your life to help you understand the perfect will of God. John 16, 13, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority. Holy Spirit will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Wow. Talk about a weapon. He's going to speak what he hears the Father saying, and he's going to tell us things to come. So there's your game plan for every day. Start on your knees. Take communion. Ask the Lord, give me the game plan for today. It says right here in John 16, 13, that whatever he, the Holy Spirit hears from the Father, he's going to tell me the things to come. He's going to tell me how to live my life. And then in John 13, 1, it says, now, before the Feast of Passover, okay? So this is the New Testament. Don't think Passover is not for us. It's still celebrated. It's one of the annual feasts. There's three annual feasts. Still celebrated. Should be celebrated in the church and understood as the new version of Passover, the new exodus coming out of sin into this deliverance power of God over us. All right, so John, that's New Testament 13, before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Would you mind just getting a shot of the uh, servant here underneath? Because this is from John chapter 13. Okay, this picture of Jesus watching Peter's feet is from John chapter 13. And isn't it somewhat of a contradiction of the way the world thinks that it says king of kings, Jesus is the king of kings, and yet he's washing the feet of Peter. Need it? Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. I didn't know that. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> I guess you have to use your imagination. <laughs> it's the last thing he does with them at the Last Supper is put a towel around him and get down with a basin of water and wash feet. He took on the form of a servant. And John says it so beautifully. 
before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew, this is John 13, 1, that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. This is what the reference is. He's showing them, by my example, do for others what I'm doing for you now before I leave. Man, oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. That's one of the songs we sing in church here. And then Luke 22, 15 and 16, there's another version of the same scene. And Jesus says to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So in the traditional circles, the Jews would be eating the Passover dinner together on the next night, but Jesus knows he's going to the cross the next night. So they're having it one day early. And he says, with fervent desire, I've desired to have this Passover meal with you before I suffer. And what they did in the Passover meal was remember the deliverance when they would come out of Egypt. I'm sure some of you have done that now, even as Christians. It's called a Seder dinner to celebrate Passover. But Jesus is saying, I can't do it with you tomorrow because I am going to be the Passover lamb tomorrow. And that takes on a whole new dimension for eat my flesh and drink my blood, right? It's not literal. It's as a sign. Do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you gather together for this meal, remember me. <laughs> I will no longer eat of it, Jesus said, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then it says, he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. So a lot of you know that we've been saying for months now, even way before the coronavirus, that it's a really great thing to do to develop discipline. We're, we're called, we are as Christians, disciples of Jesus, right? We're not the 12 disciples, the original 12, but we are disciples. That means a called out one, one who gets sent and one who has discipline, it's right in the word disciple. It's the word discipline, right? And he even says that one of the fruits, when he lists the fruit of the Spirit, the last one is called self-control, right? So that's a disciplined lifestyle. And if you could get in the habit of getting on your knees every day and taking communion just on your own, not some big formal official thing, but the first thing that touches your mouth is the wafer, and the first thing you drink is the cup, we've just had so many people tell us how valuable that's been. I did it because in my secular setting, in my job, I had to be the first one in the office in the morning, and I, there was nobody else around to think I'm weird about it, and I wanted to sanctify my workspace. I wanted that place where I was sitting to glow with the presence of God and say, Lord, I don't care about the secular people that are around me because I'm your child, and you do the same thing at your house. You just get out of bed and you hit your knees, even before you take your shower, before you do anything, before coffee. I know that's going to be hard for some of you, but God can give it to you, give you that power. And I think if you can with us now, if you have the elements ready, because I know I didn't say it at the beginning, but our church has kind of gotten used to doing this now, that we're going to take this cup together. And I'll just try to tell you how he's worked it through in my life um, is just a reflection back on something I learned from a teacher that I really respect. And it says, give us this day our daily bread, right? That's, that's right in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. And a lot of us know that that definition means it could all, it's like the manna. It's only good for today. And that reminds us that every day is different. Even when we gather together as a church, if the exact group of people is there on Monday and comes back Tuesday, it's really not the same because they've all lived another day. Things have happened. There's a different way we apply what we know based on the situation and the, and the circumstances in our lives. So you hold it up. I've already broken mine, but I'll just hold up a half of it. But if you, if you haven't broken it yet, just hold it up before the Lord. And it's really good to do this on your knees, right? You're saying, God, I'm in a position of surrender to you right now. And I hold up this wafer because you identified with my flesh. You know, he said the flesh is willing, but I'm sorry, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So when you hold this up before him, you're saying, I recognize that. Without your power, I'm 
my flesh is going to be weak. My spirit might be willing, but my flesh is going to be weak. So I do this in remembrance of you, Lord, right at the beginning of my day. And then break the bread. Snap it. Because his body was broken, and then you're acknowledging, I'm submitting my will to your will. It's not going to be my way. You're the pilot. I'm the co-pilot today. I want to follow everything you tell me. So, Lord, as we do this today as the body of Christ, we take this wafer that represents your broken body. I quoted it earlier. You made a new and living way through your broken body. Your body was broken and cut open in order that we might have access to the Father through a new and living way. The veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom, revealing access into the throne room of grace. So we take this bread, Lord, in remembrance of what you've done for us. So that was from Luke 22, 17 and 18. And in verse 20, it says, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup, so I just really always like to hold it up. This is Luke chapter 22, verse 20. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. One of the most popular hymns in, in the Christian world is, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You're just saying, thank you, Lord. That, Like I said earlier, if I was the only person on this planet, you still would have come. You despised the shame, and yet you endured that cross, despising the shame, all because you loved me. Even when I was very unlovable, you were with the sheep and you left the 99 and you came and you found me and you pulled me out of that mess. And yes, I'm a Christian and I know I'm going to heaven when I die, but today I want to live in the fullness of what you have for me. I want to operate in your kingdom principles here in the earth. I want you to use me as a weapon in your hand against the enemy. 1 John 3, 8 says, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest. <laughs> that he might destroy the works of the enemy. So that we say your blood covering us empowers us as ambassadors to destroy the works of the enemy in this earth. Not because we're great, but because you're great. Thank you for cleansing me with your blood. In Jesus' name, let's take the cup. Hope you all are holding up okay. 1051 I got. Not that we really have so many places to go today, but I know you have other things to do. So Colossians 1, I call it the new exodus. He's rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, okay? Remember what, what I told you to think about the contending for the government and the authority over your life? That's the spiritual warfare. So just as the Jews came out of Egypt through the Red Sea into the promised land, this says in Colossians 1.13, he's rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. That's what we just acknowledged. First John says, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all iniquity. And you might be like, oh man, I don't think there's enough cleanser in the world because I have so much sin. There's enough. The blood of Jesus is enough. No matter what you've done, it cleanses you. And then there's a commentary. It said, when Paul speaks of God rescuing people from one kingdom and giving them another, the central theme of that rescue operation, he has exodus of Egypt in mind. What God has done in Jesus and now is doing for them is the new exodus, the great moment of setting slaves free. And we sing that one song I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. <laughs> Revelation 11:15. 15. There were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have now become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. 
and he shall reign forever and ever. Handel's Messiah. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. For Jesus, you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe, every tongue, every people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Wow. That's quite a powerful statement. We are kings and priests, and we shall reign. But yet, remember, the picture is of Jesus washing the feet of Peter. Seems like an upside-down kingdom. But that's what Jesus said. In order to be great, if you want to rule and reign, learn how to serve. 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12 says, For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure with him, we shall also reign with him. I can get you all these scriptures if you want. Just send them to, uh, send an email, info at kingofkingswc.com. All right? And we'll send you out the scriptures if you didn't get them. I'm closing in on the end here. 1 Corinthians 15, read the whole chapter, please. It's amazing. It's just so filled. It's 58 verses just in that one chapter. I'm pulling out little pieces that show you the, the contending that goes on and the power that we have in this new covenant with Jesus. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Not the old law covenant. The new covenant purchased through his blood. So I'll, I'll just do a little object lesson here as I read it, okay? This is the world. This is the kingdom of God. It says in John 3, if you're not born again and you're still in this world, you can't see that there's a kingdom of God. Another portion of Scripture says, the carnal mind cannot comprehend the things of the Spirit. So when you're over here, by faith, you have to say, my life isn't working. I need a Savior. I'm accepting Jesus. When you do that, you get filled with his Spirit. Now all of a sudden, it's been there all along, but you just couldn't see it. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he says another two verses later, that was John 3, 3. I believe it's John 5 or 6. Unless a man is born again or woman, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean when you die and go to heaven. That means right now, right here. It does connect with when we die and we go to heaven. But the reference is in this world. <laughs> in this world, you will have trouble. But don't worry, I have overcome the world. That's a direct quote from Jesus. So 1 Corinthians 15 says in verse 21, For since by man, that would be Adam, death came into the world, by man, that would be Jesus, the resurrection came from the dead. Get it? So since by man came death, Adam, by man, Jesus, resurrection from the dead. All right, so in the 22 says, For in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. The body is sown in sin and corruption, but it's raised over here in incorruption. The body is sown in dishonor, but it's raised over here in glory. It's sown in a natural body, but it's raised in a spiritual body. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. Woo! Big difference, isn't it? Big difference from just being alive. Plants are alive. <laughs> Doesn't mean they're life-giving spirits. We have the spirit of God living inside of us. We're not just breathing. We're filled with his spirit. It's your breath in our lungs, Lord, so that we pour out our praise. And then the rest of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, again, study the whole thing. You've got some time on your hands. Verse 47 in 1 Corinthians 15 says, The first man, again, Adam, was made of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the heavenly man. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Are you seeing it now? It should be making it so much easier for you to vote who the authority in your life is going to be. Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, who dwelt among us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the printed Word of God is a powerful weapon in that combination. 
Don't just read it. Study it to show yourself approved. Verse 58. Oh, man, one of my favorite all-time verses in the whole Bible. They're all good, but you know how some just click for you. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. All right? That's a really good thing to remember in the morning when you're on your knees and you say, Lord, I don't know what the day holds, but I know you hold my day in your hands. And I don't want to come back unfulfilled because I missed hearing your voice. I want to come back knowing at the end of my day today, when I get ready for bed, I want to say, oh, man, it's amazing what God did through my life today. And it doesn't matter if other people know it or not, because he knows it's an audience of one. He said, you don't even have to know. Your left hand doesn't even have to know what your right hand is doing. The things that you do in secret, God will reward openly. He loves that, because then when we're humble about that, he can trust us with more because he knows it's not going to ruin us to have power operating through our lives. It's only about 100 messages in here. <laughs> Colossians 1. Oh, man, I just want to stand up and salute when I read these words. This is a beautiful portion of Scripture. Colossians 1.15 says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. You couldn't see him before you accepted him. When you accepted him as Lord and Savior, he opened your eyes. Now all of a sudden, you realize there is a kingdom. There's a whole other way I can live my life. I don't have to live by the rules of the secular culture. Eat, drink, and be merry. Whatever, nothing matters. I can do whatever I want. It's my body. I can do whatever I want. Let's eat today because tomorrow we die and nothing happens. Oh, that's just a big lie. That's another way the enemy has convinced people to believe his lies. No. He, Christ, is the visible image of the invisible God. Christ existed before anything was created and is the supreme over all creation. Through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth. He existed before anything else. And he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body, which is how we know each other, as the body of Christ in the earth. Are we all perfect? No, of course not. God has used and broken people to lead the church for all of history. There's no perfect people, but there's a perfect God. I'm not saying stay in a, in a church. If you see signs that it's really unhealthy, you're not required to have to stay, but there's fallible people leading churches, okay, me included, <laughs> Not intentionally, but that's why getting on your knees every day and asking him to help you can keep improving. You don't need much. If you only improve a little bit each day, by the end of a year, five years, ten years, there's massive change and improvement. It's one of the greatest compliments somebody could give you is, I've known you for a while and I've really seen you grow spiritually. I've seen you mature. You're not the same person I met a few years ago. That's what's supposed to be said to all Christians because this works. When you start applying this to how you're living your life, it really works. All right, he's the beginning. This is Colossians 1.18. He's the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is the first in everything. Verse 19. God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you, who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ and his physical body. And there's a good chance somebody watching this does not know the Lord. That This language is new to you. You haven't really understood the warfare that's going on for your life and how the world wants you to live one way and God's saying, no, I've got a better way. And by you accepting the Lord and saying yes to him, you're going to get filled with his spirit of power and you're going to be able to see that kingdom that's available to you. And you're going to walk out of that darkness of sin that you just so beat yourself up over, bad decisions that you made, and you're going to walk into a different kingdom and not that you won't make mistakes anymore, but instead of condemning yourself, the Bible calls it getting convicted. 
that you don't want to keep doing those things anymore and that he enables you through his power not to fall into those traps any longer. I want to be careful. It's not that Christians don't still sin, but they lose the nature of sin because they get a different nature. It says he's made us uh, to have, uh, I'm not quoting exactly right in my mind right now, but partakers of the divine nature. I believe it's First Peter. God has made us partakers of the divine nature. Wow, what a gift that we could have the divine nature living in a sinful body. It's not that we don't sin as Christians. It's just that we don't have that nature in us anymore, and we desire to fight that thing when we recognize it. No, whatever it takes, that thing's dying. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So I'm just going to ask you to say a prayer if that's you, if you're that person who's never accepted the Lord in your life. You know, what me and my wife said was, what have I got to lose? Because our lives are not exactly chugging along, you know, on the cover of anybody's magazine. We were in a lot of pain. We were in a lot of emotional pain. Some of it for our, for our own reasons, but also things that we had nothing to do with. Circumstances in our lives that started causing the walls to start crashing in on us. And, and we knew people that were Christians, and we admired them. We, we saw something about them. Didn't fully understand it, but we saw something about them. I didn't know my wife at this time, but separately our stories are very similar. And uh, we both said yes to the Lord, and we both received miraculous change in our lives really quickly. So we're not talking out of a theory here. We know this works. And you really do need to get connected into a group of believers, life-giving relationships with other believers. But just say this prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. But I see you throwing a lifeline to me today. I didn't know about it before. But I just heard good news that my sins can be forgiven and that you can empower me with your spirit and the truth of your word to live my life in a way that's pleasing to you and to spend eternity with you, not separated from you. I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior to live in covenant relationship with you. Lord, I want to love you with all my heart soul, mind, and strength, and then help me to love others with that same love. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll send you a Bible. Again, just write to us, info at kingofkingswc.com. If you're in the area, we'll meet with you. This is what we do. We want to see people flourish and grow in their walk with the Lord. And we have a lot of really amazing, mature, seasoned people as part of our ministry team that can help you. Um, it's not a one-man show, even though you wouldn't know that <laughs> by these last couple of services. I'm going to end with the last verse. And again, I like to stand and salute because this is our authority. This is our ruler. This is our king. Jesus Christ is the king of kings and lord of lords. I'm choosing your crown, Lord. Not the corona crown. I'm choosing your crown. I'm under your authority in my life. And that's what verse 22 in Colossians 1 says. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I wish you guys are here. I know you can't be, but before we know it, this too shall pass, and we'll, we'll be able to be together and not isolated like the orphan that the devil is. And I'm not meaning to be critical of anybody here who lost their parents because God is our Father. When you become a Christian, he says that we no longer have that spirit of an orphan. We have the spirit of adoption, crying, Abba, Father, knowing that we're in the family of God. So I can't wait to see you all, family of God. Come back together again with us and 
Till we meet again Tuesday night, you all have an awesome, wonderful day.